Hi, I'm Dr. Ingrid Clayton. I'm a clinical psychologist, a trauma therapist, and a trauma survivor. And today I want to talk about the silent treatment. So one of the things when we talk about narcissistic abuse or really any form of emotional or psychological abuse, we talk about it as hidden abuse. And the way that I experienced this as a child, I'll never forget one of my friends, families called social services and they came to interview me when I was maybe 11 12 years old and the social worker sat there and I thought wow someone's intervening on my family this feels so hopeful yes something is wrong in my house like this is not right it's not what I experience in other people's homes and she sat there with her clipboard the social worker and all of her questions revolved around physical abuse do you have any bruises? Have you ever had any bruises? Are you witnessing physical violence happening in the home? And a lot of what I had to say was, no, but, no, but, no, but we're walking on eggshells all the time. No, but there's really erratic behavior. No, but there's active addiction. No, but there's emotional abuse. And I didn't have that term, but she actually gave it to me. She said, emotional abuse isn't reportable. And it was one of the first big times that I was able to, or I kind of had to minimize my hurt and my experience because it just didn't meet the bar. It didn't meet the bar for something that was worthy of intervening on. I wasn't worthy of being seen or really taken care of in that moment. In fact, once she checked all the boxes off her little clipboard, she, okay, thanks so much. And that was it. And she left. And... I felt embarrassed. I felt ashamed. I wasn't even the person who called social services, but I felt like, oh, my friend and now her parents are going to judge me and think that maybe I was making something up or asking for attention or um, was making a big deal out of what was clearly nothing. One of the ways that I experienced this emotional abuse growing up at the hands of my stepdad. I didn't know that this was emotional abuse. I also didn't even have the language for the silent treatment, but that's what it was. And so I lived with my biological brother and my stepbrother, my stepdad's son. And for instance, we would all be having breakfast at the kitchen table in the morning, a random school day. And my stepdad would come into the dining room and say, good morning, John. Good morning, Josh. And then I'd be sitting right there, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't say good morning. He wouldn't say my name. He wouldn't even look in my direction. It was like I literally did not exist in my own home. I felt like a ghost and it was horrifying. It was so traumatizing. Again, I didn't have that language, but it was. And I kept asking like, what did I do? as any child would and does, what did I do to make this happen? Is it because he knows I don't like him? Is it because, you know, maybe I was being a typical kid, doing typical kid things, but I kind of had to make those things bad, at least bad in his eyes, bad enough, I had to be bad enough that I caused this behavior somehow. And this could go on for long stretches. You know, and then we lived in the mountains in Colorado, and so he drove us to school every day. It was like a 45 minute drive in the car with him. And the silent treatment just for me, not for my brothers, would continue. So I'd see him having a conversation in the front seat with his son, and it was as though it was a conversation at me because he would talk about things and display interest in things that may have even been related to me, but I didn't get to be a part of that conversation. And then same thing when he dropped us off. Have a great day. See you later, pal. I love ya. You know, see you tonight. And we had a minivan and I'll never forget exiting the back door of the minivan. It was as though he was just waiting long enough for that door to close to drive away and all I felt was the heat of his hatred, just like oozing out of the car. That was my send off on many mornings, right? Not have a good day, Ingrid. Not, you know, 
good luck on that test today. They never knew when I had a test. Um, just the heat of his hatred emanating from the vehicle until the door was closed and he could drive away. And I would have to do it all again the next day. And so what I didn't know then, but I know now, is that that is emotional abuse. That is abusive. And it didn't matter that I didn't have visible scars on the outside of my body, which is what I wished I had had, to be honest. I wished that I had something that was visible so that I could be taken seriously. What I had, what I carried for many, 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 many years are these internal scars, these ruptures um, in my self-esteem, in my self-concept, in my ability to know and trust myself. Because now I just feel defective. And that's what I'm being sent out into the world, feeling. You're defective, there's something wrong with you, you're bad, you're the problem. And even if I consciously thought otherwise, right, my rational brain going, he's the jerk, like what, a, I can't believe him, what's wrong with him? And I'd even be mad if I'm consciously thinking these things, what I experienced, what my body experienced, what I learned, I had to learn to tolerate on some level is being disrespected, disregarded, not even seen at all. And I grew accustomed to that and it has an effect. It has an impact. Psychological abuse is effective. It's deeply effective. And so more than anything, I just want to give people this language if they don't have it to know that it matters, right? And this is a lot of what I think we're talking about with complex trauma is that there's these kind of obvious, uh, horrific, terrible things that have happened to people that you ask 10 people, 10 of them are gonna say, oh yeah, that's traumatic, that's trauma. And then there's this whole subset that maybe is just underneath that, that we're going, oh, was it that bad? Is that trauma? Is it that big of a deal? I don't really count, I don't really matter. And now this thing that we grew up with is being perpetuated by ourselves and by mental health professionals. We're sort of discounting the real impact that emotional abuse has on a person. And now we're this traumatized culture and people are walking around going, well, what is it depression? And is it anxiety? And is it addiction? And all of these other things that we've had language for and people are waking up to the fact that this is trauma. We have traumatized nervous systems. And when we can give accurate language we can find accurate tools to help us repair that damage, <sighs> to reparent ourselves, to find a new relationship to safety, to find a new relationship to self and self-trust and self-esteem, and change the way we feel about ourselves and our relationship to others and how we feel in the world. So that is my hope for you. And I'm so glad that you're here. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. I'm going to keep talking about this intersection for me of emotional psychological abuse and complex trauma, which led to CPTSD, complex PTSD. And if you haven't already, check out my book. It really outlines my whole story. It's a memoir. I'm a clinical psychologist, but I wrote a memoir because I believe that we can heal through shared story and experience. And that sometimes hearing someone's story allows you to go, oh, I know what they're talking about. I experienced that too. But when we just have clinical language, it's like abuse. I didn't experience abuse. It's really easy to discount. And feel uncertain about how that applies to us personally. So I've written a memoir called Believing Me. You can find it on Amazon. And thank you so much for being here.